Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This week we heard that Boeing was stepping away from its Phantom Express spacecraft, which was part of DARPA's XS-1 project. This was a project that started back in 2013 with the idea to develop low-cost access to orbit using a reusable first-stage booster. Now, of course, DARPA is no stranger to funding cutting-edge aerospace projects, but with XS-1 project, it was kind of more closer to reality than many of the other things that had been worked with. Its technical readiness level was 5, which means that pretty much every component was well understood, even if it hadn't been flown. So apparently there were three major contenders, Boeing, Northrop Grumman and Maston Space Systems. The requirements for the project would be that they would have to make a vehicle that would fly 10 times in 10 days without an upper stage or a payload. It would have to be able to carry a £3,000 payload at a cost of $5 million per flight or less. And the final part of the demonstration would be to carry a rocket up to altitude and then that would boost a £900 payload into low Earth orbit. The 10 days or 10 flights within 10 days obviously implies rapid reuse. This would be either by landing downrange or returning to the launch site. They showed pictures with wings but it wasn't necessarily a requirement. Boeing won and this is what their version looked like. And this is my Kerbal version because while the DARPA video is interesting enough, it's very short and it's obviously much more fun to actually fly these things. So the Boeing design is a simple you know, delta wing design with um, rudders on the tail, on the tips of the wings. It was propelled by a single space shuttle main engine. But since this was a space shuttle main engine that had to be able to be reflown 10 times in 10 days, they came up with a new designation, the AR-22. Uh, Rocketdyne took some old space shuttle engines, retooled them, refurbished them, and these were the ones that they were actually using on the test stand. Now, I was skeptical of the design because they'd chosen to use hydrogen and oxygen, and that is not really the cheapest combination of fuels because it results in a, an aircraft which has to be a lot bigger on account of the large tanks. So, but it, what would happen is it would boost up to some altitude, you know, some high Mach value, and then it would detach the payload, which would be, yeah, about you know, 4,000 pounds of hardware, apparently. A small rocket capable of accelerating a payload up to orbital velocity. And then having deposited the upper stage into an appropriate trajectory, the XS-1, the Phantom Express, has to flip around and start heading for home. I'm going to say I had a little harder time with this because I chose a so, such a flat trajectory that I was still quite deep inside the atmosphere. And reversing in a spacecraft with wings is, is not particularly good. It really doesn't like to do that. But with enough control authority on that thrust vector engine, we had a pretty good job. We were able to turn this thing around and turn around with a decent amount of fuel left for the re reaction control system. So from this point, the vehicle is a glider. Now this of course does sound pretty familiar. It is essentially how SpaceX gets its boosters back home. Uh, it of course doesn't use wings, it uses a rocket propelled landing. When the program started back in 2013, SpaceX had been talking about rocket reusability but hadn't actually flown anything that was able to do it. By the time the contract was awarded to Boeing in 2017, SpaceX had been landing boosters for over a year. But there were a few uh, requirements that definitely set the program apart from what SpaceX was doing and is still doing. First of all, the requirement for 10 flights in 10 days implies a level of reuse which is faster than anything that SpaceX is currently demonstrating. But also, the vehicle wasn't just going to be used to launch spacecraft, it was going to be used as a rig or test vehicle for hypersonic tests. So there was a requirement that the vehicle be able to hit Mach 10 without a payload. I'm not really sure whether the Mach 10 requirement made it into the Phantom Express proposal because if you're traveling or you know accelerating up to that speed, it's going to put you so far down range and deplete your fuel so much that returning to back to base seems like a long shot. That might be something where you fly from one launch site to a different landing site rather than returning 
to the landing site like I did here, barely. Granted, the real thing would probably have computers that were designed to fly the thing rather than me flying by the seat of my pants or the fingers on the keyboard. So anyway, despite all the technology supposedly being ready, Boeing has decided to you know, cancel its contribution to the program and the program is essentially dead because there's nobody else that's available to pick up where Boeing left off. It seems the only substantive thing that we have seen out of this has been the demonstration of the AR-22 showing that an RS-25 can indeed be refired 10 times in 10 days. I think the normal, normally the long turnaround time has been because these are used on you know, the space shuttle which had crew on board therefore they wanted to be 100% sure. Anyway there were other competitors and it's interesting to ask what might have been. Uh, Maston Space Systems are not a name you may have heard of compared to Northrop Grumman or Boeing, but they have been working on rockets for a really long time and they've demonstrated a lot of really cool technology. This was their entry in 2014. It used methane and liquid oxygen, a you know, very simple, similar design. But over time they evolved it and it ended up having this really interesting split wing version. Yes, this is a space biplane. Instead of the one giant engine, it's got five smaller engines that were all uh, 3D printed. And I actually found this really cool aerothermal calculation simulation. Basically, you know, they're doing computational fluid dynamics on the entire ascent. And this is obviously always marvelous to see everything in all these details. Obviously, at this point, the Zephyr still only exists on paper, but this is kind of cool to show the, the, the research they did actually do on it. Again, you can see the split wing design from different angles here. Comes up over the top and then pretty much falls back down towards the Earth. And you get, again, all this really cool CFD going on. That's computational fluid dynamics, for those that don't know, where you're basically using computers to model the aerodynamics. And pulls out of its dive, and then glides back home. Now, I don't see any uh, landing gear on this, but I presume that's part of the design. So I decided to try and build my own version in Kerbal Space Program, and I was able to make it pretty small and compact. That is the same upper stage as we had on the Boeing version. You'll notice that this is almost the same size. This is what you get when you use high density propellants instead of liquid hydrogen. Methane also has the advantage of being easier to store, easier to transport, more easily available. This surely was the most logical uh, choice. I mean, it's a space biplane. How is that not super cool? Yeah, I mostly made this fly in Kerbal Space Program. It gets a lot of body lift at the front, so its nose tends to rise up as soon as you put any pitch up on it. And with the wings so far back, it does tend to lose speed very quickly when I start pitching up. I also made the stupid mistake of not actually clearing the runway between these two launches. So the Boeing Phantom Express is still sitting there on the runway waiting to greet my... Uh, my Zephyr, which means I need to very carefully fly over the Phantom Express and then touch down and slow down to a stop. So this is a lifting body vehicle. That is not going to be easy. But you know, there's a famous saying that goes, we choose to do these things not because they're easy, but because we asked ourselves, how hard could it be? Oh, well, that's how hard it could be. The Phantom Express destroying Zephyr's chances. I'm sure that's some kind of metaphor. So while we're here, one other thing that I wanted to include is this video I found showing CFD of a Colonial Viper from Battlestar Galactica performing hypersonic re-entry. And actually, you'll see left and right, they have slightly different wing configurations. What this was, was while they were developing the um, Zephyr, they were adjusting the wing configurations and they wanted to put out a video showing that they were using this CFD software to model different wing configurations for the Zephyr. So obviously they're showing that, but they're also demonstrating the capabilities of the software. I think it's really cool because I'm a, I'm a Battlestar Galactica fan. Uh, having said that, I'm not sure the wing configuration they arrived at for the Viper is necessarily the one that is the most photogenic, which matters if you're making a TV show. So yeah, that's the end of another hypersonic aircraft program. 
The Phantom Express, the XS1, they will be missed. And so say we all. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.